to let you know that uh, this uh, event is being recorded and after the event, we'll be able to send you out a link for those that may not have um, registered for today. Um, another reminder, the chat feature is there. If you'd like to send questions, it will come to me. And at the end of the event, we'll have time for question and answer. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Leanne Irwin. She is the co-chair of the Black History and Culture Committee. Leanne? Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I believe you will find this very interesting and inspiring. Um, so the female reenactors of distinction called Freed is a group that began in the early of this century formed as an educational auxiliary with the African American Civil War Museum in Washington, DC, which I hope we can all go to again later this year after COVID protocols. Their mission is to join in sharing the courageous accomplishments of the United States Colored Troops by presenting women and families who contributed to those efforts for freedom that we all can appreciate and celebrate today. Um, I got to hear Freed at the National Historic Park of Frederick Douglass at Cedar Hill in Anacostia when the park was celebrating Frederick, Frederick Douglass's birthday, which is February 14th. And that's when I got to hear them speak and perform. Joyce Bailey, who I don't believe is yet with us, but she is a Greenbelt resident, is a member of Freed. And so I hope um, she will be able to say hi to us at some point during this program. Today, we're going to hear the stories of three women. The first one is Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, who lived from 1825 to 1811. And she will be portrayed by Lavanda Broadnex. We will also be hearing about Haley Quinn Brown, who will be portrayed by Patricia Tyson. The third person is preacher Amanda Barry Smith, who will be portrayed by Reverend Dr. Ruby Thomas. Thank you, women. I look forward to it. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. I was born, as you just heard, in 1825. I was born free. I was raised by my uncle. My uncle was a very unusual man. He maintained a school for free Negroes in a slave state. My uncle was very serious about this school. He believed that the small number of free Negroes who had the opportunity to attend school had the responsibility to do well and to use their education in the anti-slavery movement. I stayed in school till I was about 13 and then I got my first job. My first job was in a bookshop that was owned by a family. Fortunately, during my free time, I was able to read and I read and I read and I read. I was able to build on the foundation that I had received in my uncle's school. After a few years, I left that job and traveled around a little bit, but I eventually settled in New Bedford, Maine. And there I was still searching, trying to find how I was going to make a contribution to the anti-slavery movement. I decided I would try giving a lecture. Well, my lecture was so well received that I was actually hired 
by the Maine Anti-Slavery Society as a traveling lecturer. This turned out to be a great year for me because not only did I get a job as a traveling lecturer, but my second book of poetry was also published. So as I traveled giving my lectures, I also read poetry from my book. The newspaper reviews of my lectures were excellent. This was important to me, but it was important to all women because you see just one generation before me, women were not allowed to speak to a mixed audience. And that is an audience of men and women. I subsequently was hired by other state anti-slavery organizations. And this experience laid the foundation for my life's work. Throughout my life, I was a writer. You heard about my poetry. I also wrote short stories. I wrote a novel. I wrote letters. I wrote essays. And all my writings were about the injustices that existed. My primary goal as a writer was to change people's attitudes, to change their minds, to get them motivated and to make them feel empowered to take action. I wasn't just a writer, I was also an activist. I participated in many organizations, both colored organizations and white organizations. The list included abolition society, temperance groups, suffrage association, spiritual and church organizations. I frequently had leadership roles in these groups. I'm going to share a couple of my poems with you. The first one is titled The Slave Mother. And this one was written to show the humanity of the enslaved people. And that was because one of the justifications that people used for slavery was they're not humans. They're not humans. So in this poem, you'll see that we are humans. The slave mother. Heard you that shriek? It rolled so wildly in the air. It seemed as if a burdened heart was breaking in despair. She is a mother, pale with fear. Her boy clings to her side and in her kernel vainly tries his trembling form to hide. He is not hers. Although she bore for him a mother's pain, he is not hers. Although her blood is cruising through his vein, he is not hers. For cruel hands may rudely tear apart the only wreath of household love that binds her breaking heart. They tear him from her circling arms, her last and fond embrace. Oh, never more may her sad eyes gaze on his mournful face. No marvel then those bitter shrieks disturb the listening air. She is a mother and her heart is breaking in despair. The second poem is titled A Double Standard, and it was written after the Civil War, during another phase in my life. Do you blame me that I loved him? If when standing all alone, I cried for bread, a careless world pressed to my lips a stone. Do you blame me that I loved him that my heart be glad and free. When he told me in the sweetest tones, he loved but only me. Can you blame me that I did not see beneath his burning kiss, the serpent's wiles, nor even hear the deadly adder hiss? Can you blame me that my heart grew cold, that the tempted 
tempter turn when he was fettered and caressed and I was coldly spurned. Crime has no sex and yet today I wear the brand of shame while he amidst the gap and proud still bears an honored name. Should you blame me if I've learned to think your hate of vice a sham when you so coldly crush me down and then excuse the man? I'm glad God's ways are not our ways. He does not see as man. Within his love, I know there's room for those whom others ban. No golden weight can turn the scale of justice in God's sight. And what is wrong in woman's life, in man's cannot be right. The last poem that I'm going to share is titled, Bury Me in a Free Land. Many times when I share this poem, the audience would think I was talking about where I wanted to be buried, but I wasn't. When I was born, slavery had existed in America for about 200 years. And what I'm saying in this poem is that when I die, I want the audience and everybody else to have gotten busy and eliminated, ended, removed slavery so that it did not exist anymore. In the new mall, the new African-American mall, the new Smithsonian African-American mall on your mall has a contemplative court. And in that court, there are quotes from four people, Sam Cooke, Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, and me. And the line that is mine in that room is taken from this particular poem, bury me in a free land. Make me a grave where'er you will, on a lowly plain or a lofty hill. Make it among earth's humblest graves, but not in a land where the men are slaves. I could not rest if around my grave I heard the steps of a trembling slave. His shadow above my silent tomb would make it a place of fearful gloom. I could not rest if I heard the tread of a coffle gang to the shambles led and a mother's shriek of wild despair rise like a curse on the trembling air. I could not sleep if I saw the lash drinking her blood at each fearful gash. I shudder and start if I heard the bay of bloodhounds seizing their human prey. If I saw young girls from their mother's arms bridled and sold for their youthful charms. I ask no monument proud and high to address the gaze of passers-by. All that my yearning spirit craves, bury me not in the land of slaves. My name again is Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, writer and fighter. Miss Pat, you're up next. Hello. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hallie Quinn Brown. I'm a teacher, an author, an elocutionist, which is a public speaker a community activist and a club woman. Club woman meant 
that in my day, women formed clubs and that's how they got most of their work done in society together as they banded together on a particular issue, whatever their mission might be. I was born in 1850. This March, I will be 171 years old. And I'm so happy to be able to come back once more here and visit to see what's going on here in the United States. My, my, let me tell you a little bit about my background. My father was uh, enslaved in Frederick, Maryland. My mother was enslaved in Virginia. My father was eventually allowed to work for his freedom. Uh, and so he, he worked for his freedom, his father's freedom and his brother's freedom. My mother was given her freedom uh, by a uh, Revolutionary War uh, officer who had given her to his son. And then he gave uh, her her freedom. After my parents met up and married, they moved to Pittsburgh. And there um, they set up house. I'm one of six children. My father worked in a hotel, no longer there, uh, that uh, was part of the Underground Railroad. When a uh, person was being transferred from one state to another, uh, to for uh, another plantation, the person uh, made uh, uh, taking him or her would most likely, if they had to come through Pittsburgh, stay at the hotel. My father was part of that network where they would kidnap the enslaved person, make, uh, give them in a disguise and sneak them out of the hotel to the Quakers who would put them on a train and send them to Canada. That happened and for a very, very long time, but my mom became sick. And so my father thought it best that we get on that train and our family went to Ontario. There we had a farm and also in some respects there was prejudice in Canada, but we were okay. One day my father took us to a parade where we saw this lady beautifully arrayed and in a little coach and men were bowing down at her and women were curtsying to her. And I wondered, I said to my dad, who is that? And he said, Queen Victoria of, of England. So I thought, oh, I've never seen anybody bow down to a woman before. Maybe by the time I'm ready to uh, work, be a part of society, people will allow me to, 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 to be a part of that and not shut all women up. We went on and I got used to going to school and learning much and practicing. I like to run my mouth. So I would go out to the animals sometimes and talk to them. Eventually, my, the war was over and um, my dad decided that we had to come back to the States. When we came back, we settled in Wilberforce, Ohio, where Wilberforce University is located. There, I went to Wilberforce and so did my brother. It was run by Bishop Payne. And to be a student there, you were challenged to know what God wanted for your life. And when you left there, you were to be on that mission. I wanted to be a teacher love teaching, love speaking. I also specialized in, in uh, drama and other areas of speaking, especially helping our people to speak correctly so that they could assimilate into society where they might be able to get 
jobs and manage their own lives without depending upon others to do things for them. I went to my, after I graduated, I went to a little place in Yazoo, Mississippi uh, um, at a plantation where there were still a lot of our people and set up classes and they had holes in their pants and uh, the, ch uh, the children had holes in their shoes and their hair was unkept and they needed a lot of attention and we set up classes there and taught them and parents as well. After I left there, before I came back to Ohio, I was a Dean at Allen University in Columbia, South Carolina. I was also Dean for a year of women at the Tuskegee Institute. I came back, set up night classes for those persons migrating from the South and uh, did lots of uh, things with these wonderful families to help them assimilate into society. I became involved also with Susan B. Anthony on women's issues. And I represented the United States in women's conferences in Europe. I eventually worked uh, some my way into uh, the Republican Party uh, politics that I might, we might help get the right people elected to help our people. I was a nominating voice in the convention of 1920. I, I had a wonderful life. I had a wonderful life. And many times I think to myself that you, the United States is certainly a place of freedom, a, a place for democracy. And I want, each time I come back, I take a look to see what is happening? What is, what new progress has gone on? I eventually got, went out on one of the conferences I went on in Europe, I got to meet Queen Victoria and she had me speak and, and do a, a number of things. I went there as well to, to raise money for Wilberforce University. But today, as I come back, as I have sometimes before, I, I, I see what progress is going on and there are various issues here that you're facing, tough issues, but I know that you'll conquer them and get through them. Just don't give up. I am very concerned though about your young people. They don't seem to look like they're happy or that they're relaxed and, and uh, they're just not free and, and, and gay like young people should be. And they have too many responsibilities, it seems. And they have this little machine that they have up to their ears and people tell me that's a telephone. And what progress, telephone, my goodness. And the clothes they wear, different colors and everything. And every, everybody has different color clothing and all kinds of styles. Wasn't so when I left here in 1949. I was here a long time from 1850 to 1949. But as I, I look at them uh, and, and the food, oh, the food is wonderful. And you come out of the restaurant with that, those yellow things that they call the golden arches, bags of food, it smells so good. Oh, it smells really great. You have just everything that, when I left here in 1949, there wasn't a trace of, except the telephone, and that was the one that sat on the table or, or on the wall, and you certainly couldn't carry it around with you. So I look at your young people, and they don't not only mentally look too good, socially look too good, but physically, why are they walking around in rags? I saw a little girl the other day and she had all these rips and tears in her pants. And I saw a young man, he, he had on a pair of pants and he didn't have a belt and his pants wouldn't stay up and they were down in the back. And I thought, oh my goodness, this young man, pull your pants up. 
And he started switching and, and trying to pull him up. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And I thought, why are they walking around like this? And someone told me that it was the style. I couldn't believe it. What self-respecting man would walk around with his pants down? And what young lady would walk around with torn up clothes? Oh, it just didn't, didn't I couldn't understand it at all. But they seem to be looking for something that they haven't found yet. And they need your prayers. It's a tough world that they're in. They need some guidance. Help them to see that they're beautiful and they should fix themselves up. Do the things that make them uh, look like young people of integrity so that people won't look over top of them, dismiss them as being not very relevant. They are relevant. They need you. If, if, if you have a daughter or a granddaughter or a great granddaughter, talk to her, let her know. There's a plan for her life. And when I go to your schools, I, I, I say to the young people, always do the right thing. Don't be afraid to do uh, the right thing. Don't be a person who uh, joins the crowd. You do the right thing and maybe two or three others will join you. And before you know it, two can stand together better than one. Don't worry about what you don't know. Just do what you know, and God will take care of the rest. And he will protect you as you do the right thing. But you do have to do the right thing now. America is a wonderful country, and we have so much here. And I hope that we always have the freedoms that we cherish. Because if Miss Freedom ever goes away, I don't think she's coming back. So that's why we must protect her now. Teach them respect for their country. Teach them that they must honor their family name, honor the people that are in authority. Even if they don't like them, be respectful to them. I always ask when I go to schools, somebody tell me the definition of freedom and hands will go up and they'll tell me, you know, I say, that's exactly correct. Now let's add one more thing to this. Freedom is not only doing what I want to do, but what I ought to do. And if you can do what you ought to do, you are free. So they get it. I don't know whether sometimes there's a bully in the class and they all look around at each other or what, but they understand. And ladies and gentlemen, I say to you, do the right thing before your children. Help them. Help them take care of America. Help them take care of your family. For God has a plan. And that plan is going to keep you from the wrong path of life. I'm just so honored to say that in my time, I enjoyed every bit of the time I had here. And I thank God for those persons that he placed across my path. And I thank him for placing you across my path today. For you. So finish the race. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Reverend. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord, for my Lord. Oh, yes, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord, for my Lord. And I promised him that I Oh, I'm going to serve him till I die. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Sing with me, church. I was, I, I was alone and idle. I was a sinner too. I heard a voice from heaven 
saying there is work to do. I took my master's hand and I joined the Christian band. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Praise the Lord, church. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. This is the day that the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. I thank you to be here today, to have the opportunity to stand here in front of my brothers and sisters and preach the word of God. I thank you for allowing me to be a part of your Black History Month program. Me, a colored woman, Amanda Barry Smith, here in Greenbelt, Maryland, to give you a little bit about who I am and to give you the word of God this morning. Let's give God some praise. Let's give him some praise and glory this morning. Oh, it warms my heart again that you asked me, a, a colored woman, to come forth and to give you a little word about God. Hallelujah. But I know some of you don't know who I am. So before I preach the word of God, I like to share with you a little bit about who Amanda Barry Smith is. Well, my life started on January the 23rd, 1837 as a slave on a small farm north of Baltimore in a little county called Long Green. Well, it was about 20 miles north of Baltimore and we would go in and out of Baltimore every now and then. My daddy is an important person in my life. My daddy is the greatest man God has ever put on earth. His name is Samuel Barry. And I need to tell you about my mama cause she is so important too. My mama is the sweetest woman on this earth. God sent her here as a sweet angel. Her name is Miriam. She could cook. Oh Lord, she could cook. You know how you take something and make something and make something into nothing and then make nothing back into something? Y'all know what I'm talking about. You take a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And before you know it, there's a meal on the table for us seven children. God be the glory. My daddy worked on a slave farm and that's where we lived at. But he was a faithful and he was an honest man. And the lady that was his master, she was kind to us. And she extended to my daddy that he could buy his freedom. My daddy got busy and he started taking that old hay that nobody wanted and he started making brooms and he started making them old hay mats. And he would go back and forth into the town and sell those mats after he had worked all day on the farm. I told you my daddy was an honest and a good man. My daddy knew that the Lord would supply all of his needs. All he had to do was keep the faith and don't give up. My, my daddy trusted in the Lord. Well, my daddy saved enough money, church, that he was able to buy his freedom. And guess what he did next? He bought my mama and us children our freedom and we couldn't get out of Baltimore fast enough. We put in our little buggy, our little rags and we left and went into Pennsylvania to live. Well, let me tell you what I used to do when I was growing up. Well, my daddy could read and he could write and the master, master lady taught him how to read and write back in those days white folks didn't even know how to read and they didn't even know how to write. And I would uh, 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 sit at my daddy's feet on Sunday mornings 
and he would take out the Bible and he would read to us the Bible. Well, I knew then there was an anointing on my life because when my daddy and my mama wasn't looking, I would take the Bible and I would open it up. And I was the oldest one in my family. And I would make my little sisters and brothers sit down and I would open it up as, as if I was preaching. I would be pretending, but I had a good memory and I could remember the verses and scriptures that my daddy would be reading to us. And I would preach to them and I would tell them, I want an amen, say amen. And my little brothers and sisters would give me an amen every now and then. Praise the Lord for my brothers and my sisters. Well, when I got old, around 17 years old, I thought I was in love. And I married Mr. Divine. And we had two children. Those two children later died of health issues. But my husband, he enlisted in the Civil War. And he went south. And later on, I was told that he was killed in the Civil War. I never even got to bury my own husband. Well, later on, I met me a preacher man. He was a deacon in the church at an AME church. And I started having a closer walk with God. You know the song, A Closer Walk With Thee? Well, I got closer and closer and Jesus Christ became my very best friend. You know, I got closer to the cross and at the same time, I got closer to the crown. When I think about the cross, I think about at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith. I received my sight. Oh, church, and now I'm happy all the day. That reminds me what happened on a Sunday morning back in 1870. I was sitting in Fleet Street AME Church it was communion Sunday, and I was sitting back with my eyes closed, and I opened my eyes, and right above the pastor's head, I saw a star. I saw a star, church, and I looked, and later on, I saw a large tulip, and I said, Lord God, what are you trying to show me? And God said, I'm showing you a G. And I'm saying, oh, Lord God, is, is that what you want me to see? Is there anything else you want me to see? And then he showed me a uh, O. Oh. And I said, Lord God, is there anything else? And he said, go, Amanda. The Holy Spirit is telling you to go and preach and teach the word of God. Church, I got the word just like God's disciples, Jesus' disciples, I got the word of the great commission to go and preach the word of God. I got ready and I started preaching. I started preaching all over any place that would accept Amanda Berry Smith, a colored woman. I started preaching and the Lord blessed me with a compelling voice and I love to sing. And I would break into a song every time I would be prepared to give the word of God. And I started started having large audiences coming out and I started traveling and I started preaching at, at, at white groups and, and, and holiness meetings and, and women's temperance organizations. And, and I started preaching at, at, at campsites and, and conferences and revivals and, and everybody got to know who Amanda Barry Smith is, a colored woman an evangelist, and I was able to travel to foreign lands. I traveled to Ireland, Scotland, India, Libya, West Africa, right after the Civil War. Me, Amanda Barry Smith, a colored woman, traveling as a missionary, spreading the word of God. And when I was in Africa, I adopted two children, a boy and a girl. And I brought them back to America with me. In 1890, I settled in Chicago and I kept preaching the word of God. 
I received a standing ovation, hallelujah, praise God, at a world conference of women, and these were white women that I was preaching to, and they honored me, labeling me and giving me the National Evangelist of the Year. Church, God is good. God is good. And by the time I reached the platform, the whole audience was applauding and saying, hallelujah, praise God for Amanda Berry Smith. Did you know in 1893, I wrote my own autobiography. Maybe some of you might have read it, the story of the Lord's dealing with Amanda Berry Smith, a colored evangelist. And it's been reprinted at least six times over the last hundred years. Did you know in 1895 through 1899 that I used my sales of my books and, and my lectures and my preaching fees and all the money that I could gather, I started the first orphanage for African American children there in Chicago. I was a pioneer church. I was a pioneer woman of color to preach the word of God in front of white audiences. I broke down barriers church when nobody else was doing it back in those days. Church, I wrote my own autobiography being self-taught and how to read. I've been spreading the word of God all over this land. From slavery and poverty, I became a world famous evangelist. That's me, Amanda Berry Smith. I told God that I would be obedient and that I would go. I am steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I will continue to tell the world about the Alpha and the Omega, the bright and the morning star, the comforter and my cornerstone. He is my deliverer and my divine son. He's my healer and my holy one, the light of the world, and he's my living water. Well, my brothers and sisters, I didn't look at the time. Oh, my Lord, I've only introduced myself to you. I've got to go because you see, I promised the Lord that I would be on the battlefield for my Lord and that I will serve him until I die. Give God some glory. Give God some praise. I went to glory 78 years later after my birth. God gave me my wings and accepted me into heaven on February the 24th, 1915. Church, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord, for my Lord. Yes, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord, and I promised him that I, oh, I'm going to serve him till I die. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Wow, that was absolutely amazing. Thank you. If we could have each of our presenters turn on their video and be ready to answer some questions that came through. Um, Ms. Pat, Ms. Lavanda, if you could turn them on. Okay. All right. I also would like to um, invite uh, Joyce Bailey. She is on our call today. And she is going to, um, she's from Greenbelt, Maryland. And, uh, and she also is a part of FREED. And I did ask her before we do all the questions if she could just tell us about her experience with the group. Ms. Joyce? Yes, hello to everyone. Um, I hate to follow Dr. Reverend Thomas because that was a delivery. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 
but I joined the organization in 2005 um, outside of the Civil War, African-American Civil War Memorial. Um, and I was representing Elizabeth Keckley at that time. And um, I realized when the various ladies that were there started talking together, that it's so important to let, especially the children, the youngsters, the young adults, know the contributions that African-Americans have made to this country since being brought here enslaved. And what we decided was that we would um, find out our histories in relation to the United States colored troops. I found out that I had a great, great grandfather who was a United States colored trooper, which I had never known. And there were over 200,000 men of African descent that were in the Civil War. And many people do not know that. Um, until the movie Glory came out, that was kind of a well-kept secret. Anyway, we met at the memorial and we decided at that time that we would represent the ladies who supported the United States colored troops and also made other contributions to uh, this country. And I decided that that would be an excellent thing. And I think it's important because there's so many people that don't know our history in this country. And that's how I joined. I just, we came together. We decided that we would represent different ladies from that Civil War period. And each of us has, as you notice, a special character that we do. And um, we go to various places that invite us to come and tell our history. And that's how I started. Thank you, Joyce. We greatly appreciate that. And each one of you, amazing. Um, we do have some questions from our audience. Um, the first one is kind of twofold. So if you could go in the order that you presented, that would make it easier. Um, the question is, how did you choose your character to portray? And what kind of research did you do? Okay, if we go in the order of presentation, that means I get to start. I worked for 25 years as a librarian at the Library of Congress. And at one point I decided I would do a project with African-American women from the Civil War era who were authors. And in searching out women who were authors, I discovered Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. And I was, I, I was just amazed by her and I decided I would portray her. Okay, well, uh, my character, Holly Quinn Brown, I have to say what uh, one other lady said when we were, she was being interviewed by a, um, a, a, a a newscaster, uh, and uh, she said, I didn't pick my character, my character picked me. And that is so true. I had no idea. I went on and Googled um, African-American women of the Civil War, and, and I looked at each one. But for some reason, this lady stood out. At the time, I was uh, part of uh, a number of Christian organizations and we were doing lots of things and her faith in God, her, her, just the, the, the aura about her, uh, wanting to teach people to speak correctly. I love English. The uh, activities that I got her involved in issues of the day. And um, before I knew it, I was into Miss Brown. I had never heard of her. But if you uh, do Google her online, you'll find out she's um, in a number of places today, mentioned at universities, at the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. She was part of that. Uh, she's, uh, she left her footprint all over this country. She's a suffragette. I saw, her, uh, saw that in the newspaper when that was being uh, celebrated. She, she, she did a lot. Uh, Reverend Dr. Ruby? Uh, um, my, my, my story of uh, Amanda Berry Smith probably began 
like 35, 40 years ago. Um, I worked in the federal government and one of the uh, positions that I held was we were responsible for putting on Black History Month programs. And I still have documentation from Joyce's organization back in the 70s <laughs> when we were trying to put on Black History Month programs. And there was nothing out there. And so I decided that I was going to create some Black History uh, uh, programs for especially the schools and, and other government agencies. And at that time, C.R. Gibbs uh, had a lecture circuit uh, 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 that he was going uh, di to different places and he was um, uh, educating folks about Black history. And we met and I started lecturing with him. And then I branched off from him and I started doing my research and I, it was called Black Women from Maryland, the famous and the forgotten. And uh, so there was forgotten people that people just didn't know anything about. And one of them was Amanda Berry Smith. And then as years passed, God called me uh, to be a preacher. And, but it was, so it was only natural <laughs> that I went back and I looked at Amanda Berry Smith's life. And I'm saying, my God, her, her life, he, 100 years, 150 years later, uh, about the struggle of women uh, in the pulpit and women being accepted uh, as being anointed to preach the word of God. I said, I, I got to tell this lady's story. Um, so um, that's how I ended up with Amanda Berry Smith, the, the colored evangelist. That's great. Um, the next question is kind of along the same lines they want to know um how was the research done for each of your historic figures um do you talk about it as a group or do you do it individually and you know what other resources are out there for you um to to portray your character anyone can answer well i uh the, I, I just Google and, and more and more information comes online about my character as the months evolve. I found different pictures. I found uh, different things about her. Eventually, I want to visit Wilberforce University where she is uh, buried. And I want to find out uh, much more about her so there's a lot about her online for me. So, but I stick with the basic uh, story. Sometimes, you know, Google can, uh, their, their information out there is contradictory. And I try to stay with that information that has been um, proven to be uh, true. So sometimes now, even now, I'll leave out things in my presentation that I used to put in some time back. That's great. Um, one of the questions um, is specifically to um, LaVonda. Um, they want to know, did Ms. Watkins Harper become active in the women's suffrage movement? Yes, yes, she did. Uh, there were actually a at least a couple times, there are a couple of her speeches that are still available today where she was actually invited to speak at um, women's conferences. Now, when she spoke, what, you may know already that uh, there were issues between in the women's suffrage movement about the participation and the support for African-American men getting the right to vote. So at a point, the suffrage movement, the, the white women's suffrage movement split over that issue. And so at one point when Frances Harper was invited to speak, a part of her message addressed the racism that existed in the suffrage movement. 
she also worked very strongly with African women, African American club women. And at one point, the African American club women decided to unite the individual clubs and form the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. And Frances Harper was the first vice president of that organization. So yes, she did participate in the suffrage movement. And the poem that I read, The Double Standard, was written by her during that time and as she was doing that work. But there were many other things that she wrote also. Great, thank you. Um, we did have a comment um, about Amanda Berry Smith. Um, she was mentioned in a recent story of the Black Church done by Henry Louis Gates Jr. on PBS. Did you mm -hmm. see that? Good, I see you're shaking your head. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> one of the other questions that came through a couple times was um, the participant or the guests want to know if they can see some of your garments that you have on today. Um, is that an option or is it, um, is it best to share the picture with them that you sent? Well, for mine, um, there's nothing much more to see. It's, it's all, all black and my camera wouldn't take it. Uh, my camera would, wouldn't take in the whole view, but you know, if they um, want to see another outfit that I'm in, I do believe your office has a character page. And so maybe they could ask you to send them that character page for each of us has not only the picture of our character, but it has a picture of us in period dress. Yep, I can definitely do that. Um, one of the other questions, and I know, um, I know uh, for where Amanda Berry Smith's she had gotten married and had kids. Um, did the other um, women get married and have kids? No, mine didn't. My, mine was single all her life. Frances Harper uh, did get married. She married uh, a gentleman who lived in Ohio. And at the time that she got married, she had been on the lecture circuit for a while. So she had accumulated a tidy sum of money. And with her husband, who was a widow, she, they bought a farm. Her husband, unfortunately, died soon, maybe, a, he, he died a few years after they were married. And realistically, in Ohio at that time, women could not own property. So her property and everything that was in that house was taken from her. And so she had to start her life over again from scratch. While she was married, she did have one child with that husband and she didn't marry again, but she raised her daughter and her daughter unfortunately uh, died before she did, uh, just a few years before she did. Okay, great. Um, one of the other questions that came out, um, and not sure if you if you know the answer to this, is how do you find out if descendants served in the U.S. Color Troop? Oh, that's easy. Joyce, why don't you answer that one? You would go to the African American Civil War Museum in Washington, D.C., 1925 Vermont Avenue Northwest. They have books that indicate or give the names of the various soldiers that participated in the Civil War. So you have the name of your um, ancestor or the person you're looking up, take that with you and then go in and, and you'll be welcomed very fondly and then and help to show how to do that. Now with my character, I was able, before this system was set in motion, I went to the National Archives and it was just a blessing that they had, they were cataloging the United States colored troops at that time. And that was, like I said, about 2004. And um, they had gotten to um, K's, they'd gotten to L's actually. And my uh, ancestor's name was Kendall. So I was blessed in being able to find that information. Now you don't have to go through all of that. 
Okay, thank you. One of the um, one of our guests also <clears throat> mentioned that C. L. R. Gibbs has a book with all the names also. Um, another question that just came through um, is how does one get involved with your group, Freed? Oh, that's a wonderful question. <laughs> We're always, uh, whenever we do a, a presentation uh, at the end, we always try to uh, extend an invitation to any young lady, any middle-aged lady, older lady, doesn't matter. If you're interested in joining this group, we would love to have you uh, contact us. Uh, we used to just say, come the second Tuesday down to the African-American Civil War Museum. That's where we meet on the second Tuesday of every month, but the building is closed down now and the, uh, we're getting ready to move into a new building, which is under construction. So. Everything we do now is virtual online, but if they just um, called the number that you have for me, our business card has the number for me and has for Joyce, um, as well as another member, then uh, we could always uh, talk with them or they can send us an email. Uh, you know, from your office would have that information and, and we just, Love to have you. It's surprising the number of uh, ladies that we've acquired from different places, from the library or uh, wherever. We're especially looking for young women because many times we have been invited to parades and some of them are very long. And we wanted to train some young women who may not have the time to get into character but at least march for us uh, in some of the parades. And, uh, you know, we would outfit them and uh, show them how to, how to march for us. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, and as Miss Pat said, um, after the presentation, I will send a follow-up email and it will have their contact information. I also will give information of each character that they portrayed. Um, we've had several comments come through. Wonderful presentation, very informative, absolutely amazing. Um, thank you to each of you. I know that it's a, a big undertaking. Um, I don't have any other questions um, that came through. So Leanne um, and Miss Lois, if you'd like to give some final comments, um, that would be appreciated. Good afternoon, ladies. This was an absolutely wonderful presentation. And um, we selected, well, I selected Ellen, um, Ellen Watkins Harper this year as one of four women that we are highlighting um, monthly. Most people didn't know about her. I knew about her. Believe it or not, I learned about her reading a romance novel, a historical. <laughs> Be surprised what you learn in historical romance novels. Mm -hmm. um, so she was the person we selected and, and, and I was very impressed with the person that she was. So, and I wanted more people to know about her because lots of folks know about Ida B. Wells and her, and her work with the suffragette movement, but a lot of folks did not know about um, Ellen, Ellen Harper. Uh, Watkins. So thank you so much. This was been very enlightening. And I will be in touch with you because there's probably more information that we need to learn from you in terms of putting together our Black History Month event. So I'd appreciate any resources or ideas that you all are willing to share with us in moving that forward. So I thank you. And I also thank those in the audience that came and participated. Very well, much appreciated. Lois? Yes. This is Susie. Could you show us who's attending today? And then I wanted to let you know that the years that I was getting speakers for the Golden Age Club, uh, Joyce's group would come every February. So hopefully we'll be back in whatever in service <laughs> in 2021 at the end, maybe. Yes, yes. Oh, and Joyce's mother has a display at the African American Museum that she didn't mention. 
Joy? It's also online. If you go into the uh, National Museum of African American History and Culture, they have a listing of the various um, activities and sections that they have. Hers would be under fashion, clothing, it might be under art, but go in there and the Black Fashion Museum is the museum that she's talking about. It was, um, my mother started that museum in 1979 in Harlem, New York. And the museum moved here in, 19, in the 1990s uh, because unfortunately my mother developed Alzheimer's. And that was the museum that I donated, the collection. I donated to the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Thank you for doing that. Thanks, uh, Susie, for bringing that up. Um, Joyce, if you want to email that to me, I can include that in the follow-up email. Um, okay, will yep. do. Yep. But thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, I did put in the chat um, the link to our flyer. Um, we do have some events still coming up for the rest, the remainder of the month. So all are welcome. And I know that I could probably speak on behalf of everyone that joined us today. Thank you, each of you, wonderful job. It definitely was a blessing to, to be here with each of you today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank all you. right, well, everyone have a great day. And um, again, we'll follow up with an email with the recording and other informative information regarding today's presentation. Uh, can I ask one more thing, Brittany? Did you get everything you needed, Brittany Gaddy? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Brittany's yes, a young I, reporter. Yep, I told her I would send her some stuff too, so she's going to report it in the news review. Good. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, women. This is uh, Leanne. Thank you for um, a great program. Um, I am going to go find uh, Amanda Berry Smith autobiography. Um, so that, that will be some winter reading. Um, and um, I think so. All right, well, thank you all so much. Have a great day. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.